Okay, thank you. Welcome back. I am uh, very excited and uh, indeed deeply honored to welcome our second and last keynote, uh, Professor Alessandro Vespignani from Northeastern University. Uh, I, I think uh, Alex is a terrific uh, person for this event. He has a clear interdisciplinary bent to his work. Uh, his, his work has just broad-ranging influences, including uh, that of my own and several others in political science, but uh, also across uh, network analysis and uh, a, a number of biological studies as well. I'll, I'll read his uh, a little more formal bio from him uh, right now. His research activity focuses on the interdisciplinary application of statistical and numerical simulation methods in the study of biological, social, and technological networks. For several years, he's been working on the characterization and modeling of complex networks. He is now focusing his research activity in modeling the spatial spread of epidemics, including the realistic and data-driven computational modeling of emerging infectious diseases, uh, the resilience of complex networks, and the collective behavior of techno-social systems. Prior to joining Northeastern, he was the uh, J.H. Rudy Professor of Informatics and Computing at Indiana University and served as the Director of the Center for Complex Networks and System Research and the Associate Director of the Pervasive Technology Institute. Vespignani worked at the International Center for Theoretical Physics at UNESCO in Trieste and at the University of Paris Sud in France as a member of the National Council for Scientific Research before moving to Indiana University in 2004. He received his undergraduate degree in 1990 and PhD in 1994, both in physics from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. He carried out postdoctoral research at Yale University and Leiden University. Uh, I can keep going, but I, I will instead turn to uh, Professor Vespignani for his presentation. Thank you very much, you know, for the, how to say, very thorough introduction. And uh, thank you to all the audience. It has been a long day. You have a lot of stamina to be still sitting here. And uh, I will uh, uh, talk about, uh, I will take the, the, the big data perspective uh, and plug into modeling. Uh, let me first of all uh, uh, tell you that I will present recent work that I've done uh, uh, within the framework of, uh, of a center uh, of excellence of NIH, uh, the CIDID, uh, that is under the Midas Umbrella Initiative and uh, with, uh, with also the sponsorship of uh, uh, DITRA. Uh, and these are my collaborators on this effort. However, I will mention work done in the past years that really includes probably uh, a very, very large number of people and teams. Uh, and a lot of, uh, of funders that I, I want to acknowledge because it's, uh, it's, uh, they have been really instrumental in, in part of the results I, I will show. So let me start uh, from, from this, because this is what we are uh, uh, used now. So we can find for a lot of systems and a lot of uh, phenomena, uh, forecasts that can be very, very precise, can be statistics, uh, can be projection, but they, you know, they are sitting in computers. We can just at the fingertip get on our uh, tablet and get, you know, weather forecast, uh, the next eclipse of the moon, and all this information in a very precise way. You know, this is what I consider is uh, one of the most striking things about modeling. So all those is because we have modeling power. And then we can project uh, in, uh, in the future and we can get prediction. Unfortunately, as you all know, there is a bunch of systems and problems uh, and, uh, and phenomena in which we are still lost. In a sense, we have been spoiled by natural systems in our uh, forecasting power, but if we think about, you know, many natural phenomena uh, that range from economics to epidemics uh, to crisis management, uh, we do not have that, that kind of, uh, of uh, uh, forecasting power or even modeling power. And this goes toward the, the question that uh, Irena asked this morning. So do we have with big data some example of real-time application or where we have really able to do things, you know? 
Well, you know, what is, what is the problem in all those, uh, those systems? I will now, how to say, use uh, through, this, uh, through this talk the example of infectious diseases. That is what, you know, I, I use and I, I'm, I'm working uh, the most in the last period. You know, for instance, you see that uh, uh, if you look at numerical weather models, uh, the first approach is in 1920. So Richardson uh, did try, actually did succeed in integrating manually uh, the constitutive equation of, uh, of atmosphere and actually did calculations for one month by hand, you know, to get a prediction of the fork, uh, a forecast, a weather forecast about weather. And actually his prediction was wrong. And it was not wrong because of the equation, but it was wrong because of, uh, how to say, clerical errors in the calculation when you have to, to, to develop those kind of things. And he calculated even uh, what how many people should do calculation to get real-time prediction, and obviously where, you know, hundreds of thousands of people solving the equation at the same time. You know, the same, uh, in, in, uh, around the same uh, period, you know, there were also numerical epidemic models, like the, the, the numerical weather model. So in which uh, grid frost define a simple chain binomial processes for a susceptible infectious recover model, and they did integrate stochastically with, uh, we say, a sandbox computer. That means really extracting uh, colored uh, uh, bolts from, uh, from an urn. So, you know, really doing the hard uh, uh, stochastic simulation. And then, you know, we get uh, into the 50s where the first numerical weather forecast, actually a 24-hour computation for a 24-hour prediction, so basically useless, but, you know, it's a proof of concept, was done in weather. Well, same year, more or less, first read frost model that is uh, f uh, see, sees a numerical implementation on computer. So you say, well, okay, the fields are aligned. But then suddenly, in 1955, we have numerical weather prediction and the establishment of the United States uh, Weather Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. So you get here. This seems primitive, but it's numerical weather forecast. Well, and instead, what happens in, in numerical epidemic models? Well, we have to get to 2005 to get a few uh, data-driven agent-based agent models that have the realism that we could compare with the, probably the 55, uh, the 60s uh, numerical weather forecast. And now, you know, in 2015, you know what is the business of weather forecast. And actually, in 2015, I will show you what is the state of the art in, uh, in uh, numerical modeling. What is the problem in all that? Well, the problem is that we are talking about socio-technical systems. So we are talking about a mixture of a social component, an infrastructure component, a biological component. And uh, while we were able to map accurately, send satellite in orbits, et cetera, et cetera, for weather forecast, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we were still lacking data on social on the social aggregate and this is not just because of uh, conceptual issues in the sense obviously there were resistance in social sciences of saying okay you cannot really build a social physics but actually there were people like uh, Lundberg Moreno advocating for a social physics since since you know probably more than 100 years if I don't want to go even uh, back uh, to, 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 to 200 or 300 years ago and so what is the problem the problem were, was data so mostly was data. Then there were other things like our understanding of complex systems, systemic approach. But you know, the big issue is how we get data and uh, you know, how we get the mobility of people, how we, we, uh, we get map of behavioral changes during an epidemic or during uh, uh, information transfer, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all that has changed in the last 10 years because of the big data that, and the data science we are discussing today. And actually, this, I think, has been hyped in a sense. If you go back 10 years ago, there, were, there was an article saying, you know, the end of theory. Basically, you just get a lot of data. You plug into uh, machine learning things, and then you get whatever you want. And obviously, you can predict uh, whatever with big data. It, it's not like that. And actually, there is a lot of things that we, you can do. For instance, uh, one year ago, we write, uh, since uh, Google Flu Trend is one of the paradigms that is often used to exemplify the power of big data, Together with uh, a political scientist uh, team, uh, with David Lazar, led by David Lazar, we wrote a paper about uh, Google Flu Trend that actually was a criticizing, but uh, we will see later. It's not a critic in the sense that it's, it's obviously outstanding work, but we need to be careful when we, we do those kind of prediction. Unfortunately, you know, I'm a, 
a big advocate of big data, but after that paper, everybody was saying, you know, that I was killing big data. That is not the case, actually. You know, I will uh, advocate more and more for the big data. Well, what are those, uh, where are those big data and, and uh, how we can provide a kind of uh, characterization? Well, first of all, there are active and passive uh, uh, big data uh, or data collection. The first one is, for instance, if we think about uh, about uh, active, uh, you can think about what we can do in, in monitoring face-to-face -face interaction by using RFID tag, collecting uh, uh, people and airplane traveling to understand the mobility on the, on the global scale, or you know, looking at communities, doing surveys. This is all active. So we have to do an effort. We have to ask people. We have to collect data in a way that involve uh, you know, participations. And there are also participatory platforms like uh, you know where you ask volunteers for instance to tell you about uh, uh, their health status etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but there are also passive uh, data collection for instance everything that we can get from mobile phone traces uh, all the mobility that have been used uh, even in remote region of uh, of the world uh, you know in west africa or in big cities is data that are passively collected just by the fact that we leave these digital uh, uh, crumbles uh, with our telephones, et cetera, et cetera, we don't need, in a sense, the participation of people. We just get floated by that kind of data. And there is much more data that we can get that way because we can, you know, passive data analysis means, uh, you know, search engine queries, it means uh, Twitter conversation, Wikipedia logs, uh, Facebook postings. Uh, even restaurant reservation cancellations and things like that that are used to, 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 make, uh, to, make, uh, to make predictions. Please come in. <laughs> okay, so now generally when you have those long time series uh, of, uh, of passive data, what you are inclined to do is to say, okay, well, take let's take the time uh, series analysis and let's apply all the magic that we, we know about statistics and what, how to do in terms of prediction for a time series. So for instance, if you have uh, the flu timeline, uh, you can uh, correlate you know, with, uh, with Google uh, flu queries uh, and you can predict the next two or three uh, weeks uh, incidence of the flu, you, you obviously you have your, uh, your calibration of the data, you train the data, etc, etc. But you have to be very careful, first of all, because if you do this exercise, you realize that actually even simple, uh, uh, you know, lag the regression model, autoregression model, already get a 90% accuracy on the next couple or, or of data points. And so you, you, you start wondering, well, but it is really worth this huge effort uh, for a 10% uh, uh, improvement in the prediction, especially if the risk is that then, since uh, I use a lot of data that in some cases are black boxes, uh, you know, I could at a certain point overshoot badly without really realizing what is, uh, what is in, uh, in the system. And then there are a lot of statistical biases. This is a very nice paper by Marcel Salaté that was looking at uh, Twitter, the Twitter signal. And obviously, you can correlate with uh, words like flu or uh, seek, and then you get a very nice correlation with the flu uh, time series. But then if you take zombies uh, as a, one of the keywords, you get even a better correlation. And so what is the point? You, know, you, you have to be very careful. So what, what are you doing? It's you know, every time that you put a bunch of uh, a large amount of data into those kind of systems, you get good results. But what, what really are you, are you learning? And this is one of the things I'm advocating here, is the fact that actually you don't want to just do nowcast. You don't want to just predict the next three time step or, or get an information about a time series analysis. What we, why I'm so fascinated by weather forecast is for this kind of exercise. When you take an hurricane, and then you try to have you know, ensemble prediction and combination of models that will tell you the trajectory you know, several days in advance, one week in advance. And why is that possible? Not because you have just the time series of that, but actually because you know about the physics and the microscopic processes that you plug into the model. And this is what you want to do with social technical system. You want to understand not just you know, what will be 
a certain number, but you want also to get information about the macroscopic effects. So what, what is happening? What is the, me the, the mechanics driving the system? What are the behavior of people, et cetera, et cetera? So if you think uh, in, uh, in these terms into, in, in the uh, epidemiological framework, in the epidemic modeling world, what you want to do is to create a kind of weather forecast in which actually your agent, your, your, your atoms are the people, and then you want to go what we call micro-individual based large-scale computational models of disease spreading. Well, this means that you need to have, uh, you can use different techniques, you can use individual based uh, structure, metapopulation model, uh, agent-based model, but obviously all those issues have, have one have the same challenges. You are looking at simulating from 100 millions or millions of individuals to billions of individuals. So you want to have a lot of very precise data and these models are data hungry. You know, there is also lack of information. It's not just like weather. You know, there are things like, for instance, if I have a vaccine, the people will ask for this vaccine, they will be inclined to, to go and, and be vaccinated or not. And in, in many cases, you don't know that beforehand. So you have to factor many things into, into, into the forecast system. But, you know, in a sense, we are now in the position to start building those systems because of big data. This is the example I, I, I provide. This is something that we started 10 years ago, and this is for global uh, uh, epidemic modeling. So we, have, uh, we collect many data layers that goes from population and census data uh, on a grid that is five by five miles and uh, over the, the, the world. And then you get all uh, human mobility data that you can gather from airlines uh, to commuting pattern, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then on top of this simulated world, you plug the disease. The fact that uh, individuals can get sick, they meet other people, they can transport the disease, uh, uh, they can be the carrier that transport the disease in other places in the world. And out of that, you get a kind of microscopic simulations of the disease evolution once you know the initial condition of the, of the infection. That means the number of individuals, the cluster of people that are sick, the transmission dynamic of the disease. You need, obviously, for each disease a different model. There is no model that fits all diseases. It depends on what is the, the pathology. Well, but we can do that uh, and uh, hopefully this works. Huh? Yeah. Uh, it's here, but not. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and you, the, the architecture of the system is uh, you have a bunch of data that comes from from the outside. This is the data science part. You know, demographic data, mobility data, behavioral data, the epidemic model. That is other data that are coming from the field. And then you know you have all these. 6.5 billion individuals that you simulate traveling across the, 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 the world. And then you try to uh, uh, create a model that uh, forecasts the evolution of the disease. Well, let me say something that, again, echoes what was presented during the, the morning. Networks are very important because, actually, in a cognitive way, for us, it's much easier to think about epidemics in this sense. We say we have red maps, you know, where you have the level of infection, et cetera, et cetera. But all those models are network models because we people interact as networks. We travel on origin destination matrices. So basically, the algorithm is a large network model in which you have those kind of construction. You have households, families, the kids go to school, the parents go to the work, and they meet to each other. You create large bipartite networks with different kind of interactions and at the end you have a unipartite projection with all the interaction, interactions of individuals, different transmission along those connections. And what you do is to simulate the world and to try to get information on how the disease spread in this kind of synthetic system. Well, obviously this is very nice and you can do nice uh, simulations in which you start with a certain disease in one city, that's London, and then you look really at people boarding on airplanes and going to other places, seeding the disease across the world. This is a simulation of a highly pathogenic disease uh, for London that was done for a simulation for the Olympic uh, Games uh, and it's just to see how it could spread worldwide uh, uh, highly pathogenic disease from, from, from the city. You see that in 93 days it's already in most of places of the world. And you can really follow individuals on each connection. Obviously, those simulations are stochastic. You repeat it again, you have a different pattern. What you want to do is to 
repeat that things many, many times and get all the statistical information, the pathways of, of the disease, the most likely place where it will show up, and so on and so forth. Well, you would say, okay, this is a very nice uh, simulation, but there is any connection with the reality. And that's one of the questions, is why we are playing SimCity. So we don't want to play SimCity. And so what you, we do is, for instance, uh, this model was validated during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. Uh, you see here our prediction for, of the model for the peak in the northern hemisphere. The peak uh, that we predicted was around October, November. That is a very anticipated peak for, for a flu, also if it's a pandemic, uh, in most places of the world. And actually, we did the prediction in, uh, in June. Uh, and after uh, one year and a half of painful data, data collection, uh, you see now in red what was the surveillance system. So that was the peak according to the data of the national surveillance system. So you see that the model already basically produced data which were able to forecast the peak uh, in the North Hemisphere by, with a precision of one or two weeks. So this is something that obviously is not the whole game, but you know, start to tell you, okay, you are on the right path if you have enough data, because this is just a matter of having good data for transformations. The big data, this is the error, this is the 95 confidence interval. If you are wondering about that, is that this is unfortunately, is uh, you can have different, uh, um, uh, different kind of uh, seasonality effects that depends on the weather and there are many parameters that enters it, that as I was telling you are not able to predict beforehand uh, that uh, uh, enlarge your, uh, your, uh, your confidence interval. And there are a few places for instance in which you see that the data points was uh, of the, the uh, the, the confidence interval. And actually, you have to go and study case by case. For instance, France and Switzerland was an issue with the school calendar. We didn't know that in October the school were closing for two weeks. And so that has a delay in the progression of the epidemic. And then you have to start, you know, to include more and more data to be more and more precise. Now, what you do with this kind of, uh, of things? Well, you know, you can uh, try other stuff, like, for instance, uh, uh, seasonal flu. Oh, that's, uh, in principle, should be one of the simplest ex exercise to do. Unfortunately, seasonal flu is one of the toughest exercises to do. For a pandemic, you generally know the initial condition, so a date uh, and an initial place uh, for the disease spreading. Unfortunately, for the flu, we know that the flu is always with us, uh, but then peaks uh, during the season, there is the drift of the virus, etc., etc. And so it's much more difficult to get the initial conditions. Now, the CDC issued uh, um, a challenge, and we, as well as many other modeling groups, uh, tried to define a way to predict the flu. And one that we found was, uh, was uh, an open system, because actually we fed with Twitter data, but actually can be fed with many other kind of social data, is, uh, uh, is a combination, basically, of a generative model and this uh, social data part. So what you get is that you want uh, you aim at creating the initial condition of the epidemics from Twitter data, from the conversation of people about the flu, and then you plug this initial condition into the generative models, and then you select the model according to the data that you have seen so far. This is obviously has a lot of technical uh, uh, issues. Uh, uh, you have to define what are the, the words that you, that you really look into the tweets. Uh, uh, you have to geolocalize tweets, and I don't want to, to get into the details of problems that you know very well from the conversation of today uh, about you know, what is the, the accuracy that you can have on geographic resolution, et cetera, et cetera. But it's possible to get decent initial condition because you don't want to know the exact number of cases. You want to know basically the relative difference in the conversation about influenza in different regions of the United States. You can plug these relative differences into an initial condition uh, uh, function for the model that then you explore, you know, parametrically. And so you just basically are aiming at getting something that gives you uh, relative uh, uh, density of, uh, of, uh, of prevalence and not the actual value of prevalence. And you can do that also through other data if you have. You can use uh, medical records, you can use uh, Facebook data if you have it. So, you know, this is open to, to, to many other, any other data integration. What you do is to create a model that at this point is a real model with parameters. You explore the phase space of the parameters. So you try different uh, transmissibility of the disease, different incubation time, different uh, uh, immunity, uh, immunity in the population, and you create many epidemic curves. 
you look at those epidemic curves uh, against the data that you have up to that moment, uh, and through various statistical selection uh, approach of the model, you get a set of models that best fit uh, the data that you have at that point, and then you can project along the, the season. So let me just show you, uh, uh, and you have also all the confidence interval, you know about the microscopic of the disease, and so on and so forth. Well, you can do that, uh, and if I do that and I'm able to go yeah, you can see that, you know, the models predict, for instance, the season start and the peak week and the peak intensity. These numbers is how many weeks in advance is the prediction. You get a decent uh, prediction, for instance, for the season start, for the peak week, uh, for the peak intensity. This is uh, a percentage error. Uh, basically, you are between one week uh, to zero, or almost on the right week, uh, you know, seven weeks in advance. So two months and, and a half in advance. And so this is already a decent result, although we have to improve much more that. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated for the season length because there are detail that is driven by other effects and so on and so forth. And then also you see that statistically, you know, really, you get that 80% of the model that you select in that area really are on top of, you know, this zero and one is not just the mean value, but it's really most of the models are right on, on, on the spot. And so this is encouraging that we can produce generative model that have some plus. So you have some bonus. At the end of this exercise, you don't just know what will be the incidence in four weeks or six weeks, but you know also what is the, what we call the, the reproductive number, how many people are infected by each case on average. You know the generation time of the disease that is the sum of the incubation time plus the infectious time. You know what is the, immune, the residual immunity in the population. Although there are big errors and so you want to obviously shrink and, 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 and reduce the error as much as, uh, as you can. Well, perfect. So, well, perfect. Uh, okay. In the last five minutes, however, I want to show you something. You can go also on another level and, uh, for instance, say, okay, can we use that really even in more real time in a situation that is even more unknown than seasonal flu? For seasonal flu, you have a lot of data. Well, Ebola, Ebola was one of these, uh, these cases. Uh, Ebola is a disease that you are probably know about it now because it has been on, on the first page of newspaper for, for almost one year. It's transmitted with bodily fluids. Uh, is uh, origin generally was uh, in, uh, in Central Africa, and then there has been probably the largest outbreak ever recorded in, in uh, is actually the, the largest outbreak ever recorded in West Africa. This is a disease for which we don't know a lot, uh, but we knew enough uh, to do good modeling because there were previous studies about Ebola, about the natural history of the disease. What you need is a lot of good data about West Africa, and that was one of the problems. And you have two different things uh, that you want to do. The first one is to consider what is the pandemic potential of something like that. Can Ebola get into the United States, have an outbreak or not? Or, and what is the evolution in the, in the country, in, in the affected countries? Well, you know, there is a lot of things that you can use to start the simulation. But as usual, in real time, you need to work with what you have and then improve uh, in a constant way the results uh, along the way. You know, the more data you will get and the more precise your, your prediction will be. As you see, the approach is very similar to what we use for the flu, but now it's not Wither or anything like that, just the WHO data from the field. And the model is obviously a model that is used uh, for, to represent the, a disease that has a very different uh, uh, history. It goes to hospitalization, a different uh, exposure time, etc., etc. But you do a similar kind of exploration and you end up with prediction. You can, for instance, say what will be the course of the epidemic in the, in the next uh, few weeks uh, in West Africa. And these are the things that you, that you do. You, you do. You start doing simula uh, simulation that make prediction. But this is also something important I want to stress about modeling. It's not just all about predictions. Prediction obviously depends on many things. There are a lot of caveats. It's interesting, it's good because they give you, uh, give you numbers to work with. But actually, you know, the modeling is important also because it's more than forecast. You have what we call situational awareness, intervention planning, uh, uh, structure reasoning, many things that you can do with modeling 
if you have uh, enough data to do some, some good modeling. And I just give you an example. For instance, situational awareness. You can define different scenarios, and then depending on what the data points are doing with respect to the scenarios, you can have a guess if the intervention on the ground are bringing you into a marginal containment scenario, into a con full containment scenario, or you are still in an exponential growth of the disease. And that is important because you can you know, compare what you get from the field with the results of your model. You can project what will be the probability, for instance, of observing cases around the world of the disease. And what you get you know, is that in the case of exponential growth, you get a lot of cases uh, after uh, four months, but you don't have to worry initially. And if you are in the marginal containment, you don't see more than one or two cases at the most. So those are all things that uh, uh, are used by agencies. Are you know when you analyze the situation, you wanna you wanna you wanna get that information. Well, you have also epidemiological explanation. You can look at how really the disease has spread across across the the, the, the region, or do something that is important is the counterfactual thinking. So one of the points with the Ebola was to say, what has more effect to build Ebola treatment units, uh, provide uh, uh, safety, key, safety kits to the households, uh, uh, do safe burials. Well, and then it's very difficult to disentangle that from the data you get from the field. With a model, you do a counterfactual things and you say, okay, I just build it use. I just uh, distribute kits. I just do safe burial things. And then for each of these interventions, you get how many averted cases you get. Obviously, you need to have good data about the population there, about the mobility, about the international travel. But this gives you an idea of what, what you can expect by each intervention. And in a sense, what I'm saying is that from time to time, if you are building on good data, you know, modeling is not important, uh, uh, is important uh, not despite the lack of data that you would like to have more, because always you want more data, but actually because of the lack of data. Because that lack of data, you know, is where you can go in the model and see what you would need more, what is really needed to get better, better prediction. And really, in one minute, uh, I tell you, well, what I've presented is something that is for infectious diseases is the geography, is the space, is the people. But you can get in something that is, you know, the social space that now we can map. And when we talk about the contagion phenomena, we can talk about uh, knowledge diffusion, information, uh, science, uh, how, you know, our uh, voting preferences uh, are communicated, etc., etc. And all that is just a contagion process in a space that is not anymore a geographical space, but is a social space and could be our friends on Facebook or, 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 or whatever else. And you know, you can start doing and, and make prediction and work in this area. For instance, this is the Twitter uh, uh, signals just before the, um, uh, the big protest uh, the, of 15 of May in Spain. And you see how you can really look at all the information transfer in Spain through the Twitter lens and try to make uh, you know, a model that start to gather predictive intuitions or, 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 or metrics for what happens when you build collective uh, phenomena in an endogenous uh, uh, way, not exogenous, because the 15th of May was not pushed by any political party or by, by the media, but actually everybody was writing after the, 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 the occurrence of the protest. And so, you see, this is, uh, I want to close here. Thank you very much. I think this is really what we will see in the next uh, 10 years because of data science and big data is really going to change our look and way to, to see and study society. Thank you. We have a couple of microphones floating around for tonight. Oh, please. I can see this on your side. Hello, I'm Shane from physics. Uh, so I guess when you build these microscopic dynamical models, like you, you build the, the shape, the, the form of the model probably based on some common sense or intuitions about what it should look like at the microscopic level. Um, but I'm wondering, like, you could also obviously model this stuff using some of the statistical modeling techniques we were, uh, learning techniques we were talking about, you know, over the course of the day, where you just kind of apply a black box or some kind of complex statistical model technique. 
Is there any ways ever uh, to get kind of, if you did use, you know, a statistical modeling technique like, uh, or statistical learning technique, to get some intuition from that, from that kind of like what we usually we think of as a black box to get the intuitions of what a microscopic model might be for that system out of it? Is that something that can be done at all? Well, there are two things that are now, I, I'm not sure I get fully the question, but let, let me start. So you can have those two parties. You, have, you, you can, let me do the microscopic things. That means, okay, I look at the individuals, how they move during the day. And all these things is not guessing. This is generally from the research. From data. So for instance, the household construction is really an household construction. I know how many people of that age with two kids are in an household in this place. It's not something that I'm guessing. It's, it's a real construction. It changes for each country, changes for each city, it changes for everything. It's just from, from real data. Just to tell you, when we simulate the epidemic in West Africa, we need to count the number of uh, houses in the villages and how is the distribution of houses in villages. So you are really recreating a synthetic population of the place. Then there is the other approach that is, as you say, is a black box. So you can get a lot of data and start to do a lot of uh, uh, techniques and try to get the prediction. My experience is the following. If you do, if you want to have a prediction for the next couple of points, of data points, that means generally, in diseases is uh, what is the number of cases in the next two weeks. Huh? The statistical methods are much better performing. So they are better, they really get the trend, and then since it's a statistical analysis, as you say, it, you get very good, uh, uh, good numbers. The, uh, the generative model can be less precise on the short term, but then they give you, since they have the mechanics of the epidemics. They know that you infect a part of the population and then the population get exhausted or susceptible individuals. So you have, you, have, you know, the, the dynamics of the model. They are much better for the long term. And so if you say, well, what will happen in two months, uh, you know, in terms of profile, et cetera, for the flu, you generally get things which are a little better. The problem for all models, and that's all of us, uh, is, uh, and whatever is the situation, is that Epidemics are not like weather forecast. This is the usual thing. If we predict uh, the next uh, uh, couple of points, or if we say that there is an exponential growth of the epidemic, uh, people will take uh, interventions against it. And you don't never know in advance if they will work well after week one, after week two, et cetera, et cetera. So there is the behavioral response of people. Behavioral response of people is difficult to factor in this model. You generally factor through scenarios. And that's, again, something where the dynamic approach is important because the behavioral, for instance, I can say in, in a generative model, I can say people stay home. In the black box, that's a little bit more slippery on how, how you do that. You can do through parametrization, through historical data, but not always you have the historical data, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not advocating, you know, I'm always, you know, and actually, what I like uh, is to think about hybrid models, in which, for instance, you get uh, the, the, the time series approach for uh, evaluating the next uh, two or three points that give a boost to the dynamic model, and then you, you do those kind of things. And then, in my opinion, what is the final things that we have to do in this area is to create uh, ensemble forecasts that are coming out of many, many different models, from many different models, like from a portfolio of models, uh, exactly as is, it is done for, for, uh, for hurricanes. And then you combine those models with many of the techniques that you find you know, from Bayesian averages, et cetera, et cetera. And you get even better, better prediction because they are coming from different models, exploiting uh, you know, different kind of data, different black boxes, et cetera, et cetera. Is, was that addressing your question? So and so. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, I'm a grad student in computer science. I also work in Raytheon. I remember the OSI program. I also worked on it. I worked on election prediction. Uh, so I had a question. Uh, in the virus prediction and the flu prediction, did you also look at uh, Google Trends and Facebook data? And if you did, can you s compare like Twitter, Facebook, and Google Trends? Okay, for the flu, we don't, we just work with Twitter and with data from, uh, uh, from uh, participatory platforms, so, so basically from real people telling, okay, I'm sick, I have an ILI uh, disease. Uh, we didn't have access to Facebook data. 
and no one in the CDC challenge, I think, is working with Facebook data. Uh, you cannot mine, so in, in principle, there are rumors that somebody never. has, but you never. never done. Uh, so hopefully, you know, they will, uh, Facebook is going to realize that, you know, this is data that we don't need for the single individuals. You need a, a level of coarse grading that is so big that really you cannot do the anonymization, et cetera. And especially you don't even need the, the, the you, you need the number, you know, of people talking about, you know, flu. It's not right. really, you know, some, but, uh, you know, there are uh, people in the CDC challenge working with other kind of data, for instance, coming from uh, uh, medical records, uh, insurance company, and, you know, there are very different kind of data that you, that you can use. Different technologies, and, and, you know, I always, you know, if you ask me after three, four years of experience with many of those challenges and, and real uh, world uh, situation, really, you don't want to, fall back on one model, on what you say, this is the best model. Mm -hmm. You want to have, you know, a portfolio of models, look at what they are telling you. If they converge on the same results, you are very confident. Uh, if you have nine out of 10 are converging on that results, probably the 10th model for this situation is not appropriate. You know, then this is the, the, the way you want to you wanna go on. Thank you. Okay, uh, Patrick, I'm a, uh, yeah. phys from physics. Um, so you mentioned a lot about doing using this for diseases, um, but your title says socio-technical, so I was wondering if there are other things that you're trying to model and predict about um, you know, what people are doing. So like, uh, I, I know in your slide you showed something with you know uh, armed conflict, so are you, is, are you or others doing things to try and maybe predict um, what's gonna happen with an armed conflict based on various parameters and such? Yeah, well, one of the things that there has been a lot of activity is, uh, for instance, is social unrest. So uh, the fact that at a certain point, for reasons that it's not, are not clear from uh, exogenous uh, reasons, uh, you have people starting to, to, to gather in a square and, and starting to protest against uh, you know, a law, a government, et cetera, et cetera. How this is built. You know, the classic things, example, that many will, uh, will, uh, will provide you is, uh, is, is the Arab Spring uh, or other situation like that, where actually it's interesting, it, those, those kind of examples are in interesting because there is this general common belief that, you know, somehow social media have helped the coordination of those phenomena. And so you try to see how really there was the emergence of a collective phenomena, as a physicist, you would say. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, in, in those areas. It's not easy because obviously what happens is that for diseases, uh, you work on, on a biological process that you know. I have the flu, I have to be at a certain, I, I need to have an effective contact with somebody. An effective contact is defined in a certain way and I have a certain probability of transmission. This probability of transmission is a free parameter, et cetera, et cetera. And is what we call simple contagion. In social phenomena, there is the issue of complex contagion. So if I'm exposed to, both of them are sick, and I have an interaction with him and an interaction with, uh, with him. Well, my probability of getting the disease is the same. But if I'm talking about contagions of him, ideas, information, if I have an interaction with him, perhaps I'm not infected. But then if I have an interaction with him, and this is reinforcing the mechanism, in a cognitive way, I have a larger probability to become infected because I, two of my friends uh, have been telling me the same stuff. And so, you know, and then the third time probably is even more. So all that creates much more complications in, uh, in, in, in the modeling. But, you know, there are attempts, and then you see there are papers about uh, uh, voting systems and uh, the spreading of the emergence of collective phenomena, how to do predictions, et cetera, et cetera. And also in that case, uh, I would say for that kind of situation, we have much more intelligence from uh, system which are st from statistical approaches than really the generative ones. Please. Um, so I, I, I am Jonathan from physics. So, so you mentioned that the two- A lot of physicists. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned the two kind of classes of model building, one statistical and one like, you know, you've got your parameters and you wiggle them. Um, is it possible to have the black box approach, uh, but then kind of unblack box that, that approach and kind of get out 
underlying you know, microstructure that you m might get out from a physical model? Yeah, this is similar to this question. Obviously, I can use the Blackbrook. You know, I can use uh, uh, machine learning to learn a lot about the system. You know, I bring then, uh, you know, a lot of information. I start to do machine learning and just to cluster things and I get the determinants of the disease. This is, yeah, that's obviously what you want to know. And this is important. For instance, uh, for one of the things that is important in infectious diseases is the contact structure. So obviously a small children has a different contact uh, pattern than a student, than an old guy like me, et cetera, et cetera. And what is the determinant of, uh, what, what is more uh, determining the spread of the disease? Is the kids, uh, the, 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 the school uh, environment, uh, the, the, the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. In that area, you know, machine learning, uh, pattern recognition, et cetera, et cetera, they can, can be great because they can give you information on how to modulate uh, within the microscopic, well, the, the more generative approach. And so that's for sure these are things. I'm not, you know, again, I want to really stress, I was making, uh, how to say, my case. I was, and you know, uh, since I'm a physicist, I'm more inclined to the dynamical modeling and et cetera. But you know, the, 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 all the, the, the statistical approach, the computer science approach, uh, et cetera, are crucial and fundamental. So we need to work all together. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is obvious. And most of the things that in the end you plug into the dynamical models are coming from things that, let's call it are black, the black box analysis. just give a short comment and what do you mean by science of science <laughs> that's a good question science of science is uh, if you give me your uh, paper you publish a paper the past month can I forecast how many citations it will have in the next uh, two years uh, five years ten years for instance so for instance forecast of the impact of a, of, uh, of a scientific uh, artifact or uh, what will be the impact of you as a scientist? Uh, what will be the evolution of a science area? So there we, 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 will we have a new, can we, how to say, forecast the emergence of an important technology? Uh, where we should put funding, uh, you know, not just, generally in many cases agencies are struggling, they are going to fund uh, areas which are already successful in a sense, because this is when you see that this is, the moment, but they are dreaming to have a kind of, uh, how to say, way to detect an area before it explodes, so that to say, okay, this would be, is going to be very important, let's, you know, put resources there you know, and accelerate the scientific development. So all that is what is called science of science. There is also a part that is more information uh, uh, science and uh, that means uh, and computer science or so large databases, citation patterns uh, and so on and so forth. That means, okay, how we create, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the correct uh, classification and categorization and hierarchies uh, that allow to distinguish, uh, to create a map of knowledge. Uh, physicist, uh, uh, we have something that we call Pax Index. Uh, you know, is that correct in the way it's how it, it, it fragment uh, physical no physics knowledge or not? And things like that. And there is a large, uh, large uh, activity. I think that's a terrific question to end on. Let's thank Alex again. Thank you very much. join Prakash and I and myself uh, in thanking all the speakers and the moderators for a terrific, really just a, an amazing set of talks and, sorry to push you off so quickly, <laughs> right, and, a, and an overall enlightening day. So please, another round of applause for everybody. Uh, uh, before we release you, uh, Prakash and I have some other folks to thank. Um, and uh, after, after that, we'd like you to join us all for some networking, some snacks, and some, uh, some libations in the atrium out there. Uh, graduate students, I did just imply that there will be free drinks outside, so <laughs> take note. Um, we'd like to thank some people for their work and support in Bud's Day. Uh, Prakash and I were the, were the faces, the very handsome faces of the day, but uh, the people we want to thank were the real workhorses and creative geniuses behind everything. 
Uh, foremost, we're grateful to Azar Bistavros for starting this conversation with us, uh, encouraging uh, us in this project every step of the way. Uh, it was really his brainchild, and we hope we didn't stray too terribly far from it. You guys did an amazing job. It's Thank you, Oz. <laughs> Likewise, we're incredibly thankful to the Data Science Initiative at Hariri for its generous support of the day. Uh, the staff at Hariri have just been incredible, uh, efficient, well-organized, patient. Uh, in particular, we're grateful to Cheryl Endicott, Susan Pratt and Rebecca Ochoa, among others. So thank you very much, ladies, wherever you are. <laughs> finally, finally, we'd like to make it known that we would have been totally lost on this project without the never-ending guidance, creativity, and hard work of Katie Barnes and Linda Grosser. Yeah, yeah. Again, you two have been way too accommodating to us and patient with us, and we're very, very grateful. This day would not exist in any recognizable form without all your work. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, that's enough. No more applause. Please join us outside in the atrium for the networking snacks and drinks. Thank you.